Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse. Mickey and Minnie Mouse. Officially entered the public domain along with thousands of other people. of the game have changed. The original Steamboat Willie version of Mickey Mouse is now in the public domain, opening up new creative freedoms. What's mean? What's a Mickey Mouse? Mickey Mouse! Are you saying Mickey Mouse? Yes. But what does this shift really mean for creators and fans? When something is in the public domain, it is not protected by copyright, meaning you can use, modify, and distribute these things however you see fit. There are already some excellent examples of this with our dear friend Mickey, including two video games, Mouse, a beautifully designed and animated rubber hose style first person shooter that absolutely nailed the look they were going for, and Infestation Origins, a grittier game with more modern traditional graphics that leaned heavily into the horror genre. Check the description for the Steam wishlist links. You yourself can be taking advantage of public domain resources, and there is definitely money to be made. Search Steamboat Willie on Etsy. It's an absolute madhouse over there. You can slap the original Steamboat Willie on just about any product and sell it. Shirts, drawings, digital art, stickers, home decor. Heck, you could even make a retro style video game with him. I even found this sticker someone made, which is a personal favorite. Do crime. I'll be sprinkling in free resources throughout the video, so be sure to stick around and find everything from 3D models to fonts, photos to stock video to graphic assets like maps, all kinds of good stuff. There are a few ways that things end up as public domain materials. The most widely known is copyright expiration. Copyright protections don't last forever, and after a certain amount of time, they expire, pushing the previously copyrighted material into the public domain. This time varies from country to country, but it's usually something like the life of the author plus a certain amount of time. Mickey Mouse was initially scheduled to enter the public domain in 1984. Oh boy, it's the Thought Police! However, changes in copyright laws, influenced in part by Disney's advocacy, led to two extensions. These extensions, particularly the 1998 Copyright Term Extension Act, are often associated with Disney's efforts to protect its copyrights, notably that of Mickey Mouse. What's also interesting is that Disney is no stranger to public domain. Some of the most lucrative uses of public domain assets were hatched up by Disney. Many of their classic animated films such as Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, and Beauty and the Beast are based on stories that were already in the public domain. And when I say they were lucrative, I mean it. Snow White's limited release in December of 1937 and full release in February of 1938 rocked cinemas across the U.S., revolutionizing the world of animation and even briefly holding the record for the highest grossing film with sound in the world. The Grunge YouTube channel has a really cool deep dive into the premiere. I'll make sure to link it below. It was also the first movie ever to release a soundtrack available for purchase, bringing in even more money for Disney. The Billboard Hot 100 and other music charts weren't a thing at that time, but apparently the songs did have playtime on the radio due to their popularity and sold sheet music of the soundtrack, which was a way of measuring how popular something was back then. This popularity set a precedent, as it would certainly not be the last time Disney soundtracks would be well received. They've received lots of awards and nominations and tons of playtime. You can actually still buy the original vinyl records and sheet music for some of the popular songs on eBay, which is a neat way of owning a little piece of history. I think it's interesting that from the very beginning, music has been pivotal to Disney movies. They've been creating popular music to go with their movies from the get-go. Disney's number of Oscar and Grammy awards and nominations for their music alone is significant, not to mention how well they've done on the charts and their impressive longevity when it comes to cultural relevance. Anyways, back to Disney's use of public domain fairy tales. A lot of them were old stories from various cultures that Disney adapted into movies. Since these stories have been adapted, the new adaptations and interpretations are themselves protected by copyright, even if the original material wasn't. For example, Snow White was originally a German fairy tale published in 1812 by the Brothers Grimm, who constantly looked like they were on the verge of dropping the hardest album of the 19th century. Snow White was originally titled, please forgive me if I butcher this, Snee Witkin. Schnee, Schnee Witkin. You can use the story and original illustrations and even some of the illustrations that came later, since they are in the public domain now, but not Disney's Snow White. This is all interesting stuff, and these are just a few of the many instances of Disney using offerings from the public domain.
Not only that, but some of the stories behind these stories are actually pretty incredible. It's said that the tale of Beauty and the Beast could originate from Petrus Gonsalves, also known as the Man of the Woods, a Frenchman in the court of King Henry II of France who had hypertrichosis, or werewolf syndrome, a rare genetic mutation that causes hair to grow all over the body. I'm thinking about doing a whole separate video on old fairy tales and stories and their histories, especially ones that still have an impact today. Let me know in the comments below if you think I should do that and what stories you'd like to hear about. I'm your grandma. Another way that intellectual properties end up in the public domain is if they were created by the government. This one's racist. In a lot of countries, works created by government employees as part of their official duties are entered into the public domain automatically. Some examples of this include good old Uncle Sam, many of NASA's images and videos, lots of Library of Congress and many Smithsonian records and images, including free 3D models from the Smithsonian and some of the original sketches for Steamboat Willie. And that's not all. U.S. Geological Survey and Map Data. Maps. Congressional Research. Maps. Service Reports. Maps. All kinds of good stuff. It's all in the public domain. In fact, a lot of the footage I use for my videos are from public domain sources and archival sites, like the U.S. National Archives. Materials can also be classified as public domain if the creator voluntarily waives their rights to the material and purposefully puts it there. Google has some awesome resources that are open source but not quite public domain, meaning they still have some control over their stuff while allowing you to use it. For example, you you don't have to credit Google when using icons like these, but if you distribute software like an app or a game that includes the icons, you should include a copy of the license and follow the other applicable rules. The New York Public Library has a massive collection too, and even has a really neat visualization tool that's really interesting. This collection includes over 190,000 files. You can search and filter through the whole collection to find some really interesting stuff, like these photos I found of the construction of the Statue of Liberty. Now, this collection isn't entirely public domain, but they do have a filter system that lets you only see public domain items if you want to. I'll link this below. And some things like ideas, facts, and methods are ineligible for copyright in the first place and are automatically in the public domain. The last method we'll discuss regarding how works enter the public domain involves the failure to renew copyrights and other unintentional oversights. An example of this is Night of the Living Dead. They're coming to get you, Barbara. An indie zombie movie from 1968, which was a big deal when it was released. It was part of the broader shift towards modern horror and was absolutely crucial in the overall scope of zombie movies. Are they slow moving, Chief? Yeah, they're dead. They're all messed up. Beyond its cinematic innovations, the film also stood out for its sharp social commentary. Are you sure we're doing the right thing, Tom? Well, the television said that's the right thing to do. A practice that later horror filmmakers also adopted, weaving deeper societal themes into the fabric of their stories. Without Night of the Living Dead, there would be no Last of Us, Walking Dead, Train to Busan, Shaun of the Dead. They still have that. Yeah. Etc. This movie is widely regarded as the catalyst for the modern zombie genre as we know it. Before Night of the Living Dead, zombies primarily appeared in horror as voodoo reanimated corpses or mindless drones under the spell of a sorcerer. George Romero reinvented them as flesh-eating ghouls that arise from the dead due to unexplained phenomena, setting the new standard for zombies as we know them now. The problem arose when the film's name was changed from Night of the Flesh Eaters to Night of the Living Dead. The film's distributor didn't update the theatrical prints with the required copyright notice. According to copyright law at that time, this omission meant that the film entered the public domain. Here's the title card of Night of the Flesh Eaters. You can literally see the line that caused all these problems. I recreated a higher resolution version so you can see the details. Enhance. Here it is in Night of the Flesh Eaters, but as you can see, it's actually missing in Night of the Living Dead, which was the whole issue. That right there is what caused this movie to go into the public domain, was that line right there being absent. The Copyright Act of 1976 updated copyright law, eliminating the notice requirement, among other changes. However, it was too late for George Romero, who was deprived of millions in potential earnings. Since it was in the public domain, the distribution company, Continental Distributing, didn't have to share any of the money with Romero that it made off of his movie. 
Ironically, it was Continental Distributing who was responsible for the oversight in the first place and directly profited from their own mistake. Romero's production company, Image 10, sued the distributor and won a $3 million judgment after a five-year period of grueling legal battles, but the distribution company went bankrupt and Image 10 never saw that money. I declare bankruptcy! So despite literally creating an entirely new genre, that's now worth billions, he didn't receive much from it. So what other cool stuff is in the public domain? And what's coming in the future? Sherlock Holmes, Bram Stoker's Dracula, and Nosferatu. Nosferatu! Robin Hood, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Frankenstein's Monster, the non-movie version. Yeah, baby! <laughs> Alice from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland the non-Disney version, but you can use the original story and illustrations, or one of the old silent film versions from 1903, 1910, or 1915. Yeah. That's all for the public domain versions of Alice in Wonderland, but there are others that will be in the public domain shortly, like the 1931 version. Oh. or the 1933 version. Those will enter the public domain in 2027 and 2028, respectively. Pardon me, my back hurts. <laughs> or maybe you want the 1949 version. None of these are disturbing or haunting in any way at all. No traumatic experiences here. All of these came before the Disney version that you're thinking of. Props to the OGs for paving the way. This fact! R-E-S-P-C-T. Additionally, there's also Winnie the Pooh, the non-Disney version, meaning the version where he's not in the red shirt. Winnie the Pooh has also had some interesting projects made using him since he's been in the public domain. Most notably, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, which is a horror slasher film starring your favorite childhood bear. There's also a sequel, and apparently the production company behind these movies is working on their very own multiverse, uh, which they are calling the Pooniverse. So, do with that what you will. The Wizard of Oz characters, from the book, not the movie. The public domain stuff also makes for a really good meme-making resource if you're into that sort of thing. Plus, you can use characters like Santa Claus, not the Coca-Cola version or the Disney version, Jekyll and Hyde, Mythological beings like Hercules, Thor, Poseidon, Hades, Hades, no the Phantom of the Opera, Bambi, and if you're Canadian, James Bond, though he's still protected in the US and Europe. Please hear me when I say this. Do not rely on the first thing that pops up on Google when finding out if something is in the public domain or not. A ton of this stuff is very circumstantial and variant based, so make sure you do your homework and find out if the specific version of the specific character or property that you're wanting to use is actually in the public domain before trying to use it. Future. What about the future of public domain? Who's in the lineup? Here's a list of notable additions to the public domain over the next few years and decades. And there are lots that I didn't mention, but these are some more popular ones. So how am I able to use all these images if they're copyrighted? Well, that's because of something called fair use, which is an entirely different rabbit hole. And that rabbit, for now, will remain unchaste. Thanks for watching, and please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this content. And I couldn't resist. I bought the sticker.